independent way. So born rule, of course. Sorry. Uh, so born rule of. Sorry, you didn't got it. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. It's my bad. Okay. I'll try not to get startled by any other Zoom pop-ups. Should be all good now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think we all are familiar with the born rule. That's the the rules we use if we know some weight function to assign probabilities to different measurement outcomes. And uh, what the Born rule says is, if I have some set of measurement outcomes, um, we take the overlap with that measurement outcome with our current weight function and we square it. And that tells us what the probability of that outcome is. Um, Max Born was kind of initially postulated this, and this is a little clip from his, his original paper. Uh, he published this in 1926, which is the same year Schrodinger published the, his paper, like the Schrodinger equation, although he thought of it in 1925, I think. Um, and at that point, people had used the Schrodinger equation to do to to analyze some like kind of double slit type experiments, and they'd also used it to show that if you have bound states, you get discrete energy levels, which is of course was very exciting for them because that was one of the big things they were hoping quantum mechanics would explain. Um, and the thing Born was looking at was uh, trying to analyze scattering off central potentials. Um, and when I read through this paper, it actually looks a lot like Sakurai's section on like low energy scattering. Like his formulation looks very similar to that, although he deals with wave functions of real numbers only. Um, but in it, he gets to a part where he's trying to interpret what the wave function is. And he initially, in his initial submission, said the wave function is just the probability density. And then later he was like, oh wait, actually it has to be the probability squared. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting that even future Nobel Prize members sometimes make mistakes. Yeah. Sorry, can I ask a very early question? Yes. Totally. Um, I'm just curious, could you comment more on how Born used a real wave function or like a real analog? Yeah, so the way he set, set up his scattering, I mean, I, this is from skimming over it. So if anyone has read his paper in more detail, please interrupt me and correct me, but it looks like he basically sets up the incoming scattering waves in terms of like real sinusoids with like a de Broglie wavelength. And then he says like, we must have some boundary conditions like some scattering of a hard sphere. Um, it probably makes sense to like expand these in terms of spherical harmonics. And he basically gets like the wave, the, like uh, what do you call it? Phase shift expression that you see in like Sakurai or other things for, for low energy scattering. Um, so he wasn't really directly solving the Schrodinger equation in that sense. He was saying like the solutions are sine waves and therefore I'll just like, expand everything in terms of sine waves, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he never actually like, writes down exactly the Schrodinger equation. He's just like the Schrodinger representation, things are sine waves with the Broglie wavelength and some boundary conditions you can enforce on it. Um, yeah. So anyway, he after looking at staring at this for a little bit, the spy thing he's talking about here is uh, effectively like the wave function and the asymptotic limit as you get very far from your essential potential as a function of angle. And um, he interpreted this as a, a probability. Um, and this kind of evolved into the modern formulation. Now, a question you could ask, of course, is, and maybe is a very mathematician question to ask, is if I have some Hilbert space that my quantum mechanics happens in that represents the state vectors is the born rule the only rule you could use to assign probabilities to, to wave functions and as you might guess when you're asking questions about like the existence and uniqueness of measures on hilbert spaces it was a mathematician that asked this in the 1950s named george mackey um and actually before his official paper pub asking this question in a very formal was published gleason published a response which was yes uh, at least for Hilbert spaces of dimension greater than or equal to three, um, there's a unique probability measure that you can use to assign measurement outcomes to that um, thing. So that's a neat result. Um, some other people have been around around that same time. Uh, Everett was thinking about many worlds in his thesis, I think was 1956. And he published in that thesis, he has what we now consider to be like a circular derivation of Born's rule. Um, doesn't really fully hold together from like a mini worlds approach, uh, but a lot of people were very compelled by other parts of his thesis, including David Deutsch, who then more recently, I think he had another circular he might have published, but in 99, he came up with this decision theoretical derivation of Born's rule where he like invents a betting game effectively. And he says, if you live in this mini worlds formulation, the only rational way to bet is as though Born's rule is 
predicts probabilities, um, which is kind of interesting. Paul Bush, who wrote, if you're familiar with the book Quantum Measurement, he, he wrote that book. Um, he, in 2003, published a, a, a really simple, so the original Born's or Gleason theorem is, I'm not going to try proving it because it's like 10 pages of hardcore, intense proof-based math to get his result. But Bush came up with a like one page, quite accessible to physicists proof that if we have time at the end, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of outline. Um, but he makes a different, some different assumptions using positive operator value, for, that positive operator value measurements opposed, as opposed to Gleason's original, just projective measurements, which is what von Neumann did in his original formation of quantum mechanics. Um, and then in that same year, Zurich uh, from Los Alamos came up with this really clever way to get Born's rule in like an interpretation independent way that is mostly what I'm hoping to talk to you about today. Because, well, I think it's really cool for a couple of reasons. One, it uses this really neat symmetry called invariance, which is like a fundamentally quantum mechanical symmetry that you can't get in classical mechanics. And um, if you like the many worlds interpretation, it has a nice interpretation as counting branches. If you don't, it's still like a valid, valid derivation. Um, and it doesn't use any fancy math. Like it's a very accessible way to get from your usual things you'd want measurement to do to you have to use Born's rule to, to describe that measurement. Um, so my plan today is basically like go over Zerk's derivation of Born rules for invariance. And if we have time, jump back to what the original Gleason's theorem says. And then if we really have time, go over an outline of, of Bush's proof of like a variant of Gleason's theorem. Um, and then I just put this other paid article here because um, it's kind of in the same, same genre. Uh, these are three guys from Perimeter Institute that just a couple of years ago showed that uh, came up with an additional way to come up with the, like all the measurement axioms of quantum mechanics in a very interpretation independent way where you, the only thing they require is that quantum mechanics happens on Hilbert spaces and that uh, it doesn't matter where you draw the boundaries between subsystems, you should still get the same outcomes if, of measurements, um, which actually sounds very Heisenberg in some of the arguments he made for Heisenberg cuts back in the day. Uh, so it's kind of like a re modern revamp of that. But I'm, I'm not going to, I don't plan on talking about that, but I'm happy to answer questions about it at the end. And also just interrupt me at any point if there are questions. Um, so yeah, the first thing I was to talk about was I didn't get Born's rule from this neat symmetry called invariance. Um, before we do that, I just want to be really specific about some terminology because he, normally in physics, we get really loose when we're talking about states of systems versus vectors and Hilbert spaces. And we use those two words kind of independently here. Um, in this case, it's going to be, ne it's, it's necessary to be like really specific about exactly what we mean. So in this case, if I say wave function or state vector, I mean literally just state vector and that lives in some Hilbert space. Um, and if I say state of a system, I mean everything that you could say physically about that system. So that could be the probability of measurement outcomes. It could be like just any question you could empirically ask about a system. I will refer to that like body of properties as the state of the system. Um, we're going, the things we're going to assume in this derivation are that if we know the wave function of the system, we also know the state of the system. So the wave function totally determines the state of the system. Um, we're also going to assume that we can, if we are, that the unit, that we can describe our system and the surrounding environment in terms of quantum mechanics, and that if we decompose a system into subsystems, the Hilbert space that combine, those combined subsystems live in is a tensor product of the smaller Hilbert spaces describing the normal subsystems. Um, and then we're going to assume that if we have some subsystem we're interested in making a measurement on, I'll sometimes get lazy and just call that the system, and we act on everything else without, with some unitary operation, it doesn't change the state of the system. It is important to note here that that has to be a unitary operation. If this is like a projective measurement or something, and we effectively like destroy part of the wave function, obviously that is going to change the future observables of the system. Like if our system was a spin, and it entangled with the universe, and then we destroy the part of the universe that is entangled with spin up, then there's no possibility of finding the spin and spin up. So that's changed the system. So that's why we're insisting on unitarity. So we can rotate the environment, do whatever we want to it, but those rotations should not affect measurement outcomes of our system. 
Um, and that's, so yeah, that, that's our terminology I'm gonna be using. Um, I kind of already said this, but just to emphasize, the state of the system is determined by the state vector in the Hilbert space, but there might that might not be a one-to-one -one map. We could have multiple, um, by which I mean, we could have multiple state vectors in the global like system environment Hilbert space that all refer to the same state of the system. But we'll see some examples of that in a minute. And now I want to define this kind of unique quantum mechanical symmetry called invariance, which is just invariance spelled with an E. Um, so let's say that we have a system and an environment with some Hilbert spaces associated with them. And we can, like we already said, write down the combined Hamel or Hilbert space of the system as the tensor product of their two individual Hilbert space spaces. We say that a state psi SE is invariant under a unitary transformation that acts only on the system. If there exists a unitary transformation that acts only on the environment, that completely undoes that transformation. Um, so this is obviously very quantum mechanical because in classical mechanics, the only way, if, I, if my state is like some particles associated with positions and I translate my particle, there's no way to get, we might, there's no way to get all measurements to return to their initial value by just translating all of the other particles. They're still gonna have translated position coordinates. Um, we'll see that in some situations in quantum mechanics though, you can apply transformations that are non-trivial to a subspace of our global Hilbert space and completely undo it by acting on, like get back to the exact same state vector, not just a physically similar one, but everything with same about it by acting on the environment. Um, and now, previously we said that the state of a system is, describes everything you could possibly know about a system. And we said that we don't expect the state to be changed by unitary transformations acting just on the environment. So from that, we can see that any um, that invariant transformations on the system don't change its state because they can be undone by a unitary transformation on the environment. Now, before we go any further, I just wanted to throw this up there because I think I mentioned it last time, but just as a reminder, if you, this is kind of a linear algebra result that's equivalent to something like a decomposition theorem. Maybe, value? Maybe value decomposition. See, thank you. Or even that's unfamiliar, like diagonalizing is a special case. Like, yeah, for square matrices, yeah. it's just diagonalizing. Um, so if you have a, you can all basically, if you have a state vector in a Hilbert space that's made by tensor product in two other Hilbert spaces, you can always write that, find some orthonormal basis of those two subspaces such that you can write that state vector in terms of like some complex number times basis vector one of the system times basis vector or tensored with the um, basis vector of the environment and then just summation over those. And that's referred to the Schmidt decomposition. Um, so let's say we have we have a state vector that's written in terms of a Schmidt decomposition. Um, oh yeah, please. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Uh, let me just make sure that I can see the chalkboard for this. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Like this is why the Schmidt decomposition is interesting because you have to. These bases are special that you can't write. A, um, let me. Just, yeah. I get. I get all these. Sorry. The thing we can refer to is a general case. Yeah. So you're saying, like, in general, we have psi equals like sum over i comma j of some beta i j uh, system i environment j, right? Yes. So the way we get from this to that is we say like this beta kind of defines some rectangular matrix. Like let's say that S is of dimension 
N and e environment is a dimension M, then beta is like a, you write it as like an N by M matrix. And then singular value decomposition theorem says that I have some such matrix. You can write that as a unitary matrix that's N by N. So let me correct me if I get this wrong. Uh, some other matrix that's an N by M matrix times another unitary matrix that's M M. And this matrix is rectangle that regular diagonal like this. So like if N doesn't equal M, then I have non-zero elements just on this diagonal and this section of the matrix is all, all zeros. This is where Jacob was saying this is kind of like a, that normal like diagonalization of matrices is kind of like a special special case of this singular value of decomposition. So we know that what this, and then you can interpret these unitary matrices as basis transformations. So what we see is we can write, rewrite this using these basis transformations in this diagonal form that I have up there. So if we choose a special basis, which might and might not be unique, then we can rewrite it like that. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, no, that's a really good question. Um, and, and that's why like this technique is kind of powerful because it lets you always rewrite complicated Hilbert spaces in a nice diagonal form. Um, right, so if we have if we have a state vector in a diagonal form, we can kind of think of our our goal, the thing we're trying to drive as showing that a rule that assigns probability to these outcomes is proportional to the magnitude of these Schmidt coefficients squared, or not these, but those Schmidt coefficients squared. <clears throat> yeah. Do we know that the beta uh, the beta squares are the probability of finding particle in a particular state or not? That's what we're going to try to figure out here. Figure, figure out, out yeah. here. So, so we're trying. We're talking about the A's here, but betas. Oh um, yeah. So let's. I was trying to write this with a different coefficient to make um, it clear that A doesn't equal beta. Yeah. Um. So no, it's we. So we don't know about. It. We don't know that yet. Okay. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Um, our goal, so, so to kind of give an outline of how we're going to proceed, we're going to show that a couple of things. One, we're going to show, so I said this, the state of the system we're using to refer to as everything you could possibly know about the system. So that includes any assignment of measurement probabilities has to be included in that state of the system. So we're going to, we're going to do a couple of steps. First of all, we're going to show that if we have a Schmidt decomposition like this, that the state of the system doesn't depend on phase factors in front of the A's. Like we can effectively just look at the magnitude of those squared. And that's obvious in normal quantum mechanics, but here, because we're not allowed to assume anything about how we map probabilities onto to state factors, we have, we, we have to show that. Um, then we'll consider, we'll show that, uh, in there, that swapping the, in the case where we have all of our co these coefficients are equal, we'll show that swap that the unitary transformation which swaps any two system basis vectors is invariant. Um, and then we'll use that to show that in the special that Born's rule is true in the special case where all of our Schmidt coefficients are equal. And we'll use a counting argument to show that in the general case. Uh, we recover Born's rule as well. Um, yeah, no, thank you. That was very good clarifying questions. They, they, good. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. So this is the first thing we were, I, I just mentioned we're going to show, showing that um, unitary transformations, which just induce a phase factor on the Schmidt coefficients, are invariant. This is relatively easy to see because we can undo this transformation by acting on the environment with just the x minus of the exponential. And then those two exponentials cancel each other and we get back to our original state. 
Um, so you can think about that as like, I rotate the system 90 degrees right, I rotate my environment 90 degrees right, and now I have literally the same state vector I did before. Even though classically, everything would now be at different positions, but quantum mechanically, you get literally like all the same, exact same state vectors we had before. Uh, this is going to be nice because it lets us ignore, throw away phase factors for the rest of this. And I might sometimes get sloppy about keeping track of those complex numbers. Um, if I do that in a part, it's because we've just shown that they don't matter for our purposes here. This, of course, doesn't mean that phases generally don't matter. It just means that the Schmidt decomposition, they don't matter for the determining the state. If we wrote it like this, the phases of these betas might be really important. We can't throw them away. Um, so that's just what I already said. Oh, wait, I definitely threw away some slides accidentally. I might have to go to the board. Too bad. Position. Oh, okay, wait, I have them in a different format, sorry. Uh, am I still screen sharing this though? Uh, you're, we're, we're seeing your original slides right now. But if you, if you want to do it on this, you just have to change the thing. Yeah, I'll do that. So you can, you can go to the, um, ah, there we go. There it is. Stop share. There we go. Yeah. If you just do share again. Sorry, I I wanted to update the slides with a bunch of new stuff, and I, I forgot that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did I copy all of No, don't fail. Oh, uh, can you do it from here? Or is that yeah, I can just do it from here. Let me yeah. do this. There we go. So you don't you, have to share the. Uh, yeah, uh, screen. Let me go back. Yeah. Apologies. And I'll have to jump back after I get through this because I don't have. I'm going to share your whole screen. Oh, okay. that's true. But oh, okay. that's probably what I should have done. No, that's okay. Sorry for all of the technical things today. Um, do, do, we've seen that, we've seen that, we've talked about that. There, right? Uh, enough. Okay. So let's suppose we have a Schmidt decomposition that we can write in terms uh, where the magnitudes of the coefficients are all the same. Um, so that is, there are some magnitude times a phase factor with the modulus of this is obviously one. And then let's say that we have a unitary transformation on the system that swaps two of the systems. So basically, here you see I have S1 with E1, S2 with E2, and then down here, we just swap the S1s. Now, on first glance, it seems like this changes everything dramatically. But if we're looking at just the system and asking about observables of just the system, in normal quantum mechanics, it'd be pretty easy to show by standard chain and operator acts just on the system between these tets that it's going to be, that the outcomes of measurements aren't changed. And then similarly here, we can come up, we could do a, a transform undo this transformation now by swapping e1 with e2 to get back to where we started up to some phase factor and we showed that phase factors are changing phase factors is an invariant transformation so therefore this global swap of two basis vectors also has to be invariant in the special case where the schmidt coefficients are equal that questions on that okay and now we're in a good place to, to show, show Born rule for where the Schmidt coefficients are equal. So if we have a system here, I'm just throwing away complex the phase factors because we don't care about it. And we ask, what's the probability I see the environment in state, like the environmental state one? That's the same probability that I see the system in state one because those two things are perfectly correlated. And similarly, the probability that we see See the environment in state two is the same thing that probability we see the system in state two. But we know that if we swap S1 and S2, 
where that's an invariant transformation. So therefore, the probability of seeing S1 has to be the same as the probability of seeing S2. And then that is pretty much our, that then because we're, those are the only two possible outcomes of our measurement, we've shown that those two outcomes are equally likely. And um, we've gotten Born rule for this special case. Uh, we could also do this for a higher dimensional thing. I just didn't want to write all the summations out. I thought this was clear, but you know, we could have some arbitrarily large summation as long as the Born, Born coefficients for each term in the summation are the same. We have the same thing hold where the outcomes are all equally likely. So the fact that E S one equals P S two that's an assumption, but then because we're assuming the Schmidt coefficients are the same. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece that comes from invariance. That comes from invariance. Right. But that invariance is only the case if the Schmidt coefficients are the same. Right. So I guess it all comes from the same yeah. base assumption. But okay, that helps though. So so here we've kind of gotten board rule in the special case where I can write where all of my outcomes are equally likely or where all my Schmidt coefficients are the same. What we're going to do next is we're going to show that if our environment has a large number of degrees of freedom we will come up with a way of counting these different outcomes that I'll, I'll get to next. Wait, oh, I understand. Okay, now oh. I, I didn't understand why this applied to one through, but it's because we have a one over square root of two coefficient mm -hmm. squared in, or it, it, it could have, there could have been a phase, right? But there's one over square root right. of two. And we've now shown just by probabilities have to equal one. So that, mm -hmm. that fixes everything. Right, so we've recovered the same result. like. Here we've shown that it's equivalent to Born rule because we get the same result as you predict by doing Born rule. So here, if we ask like, what's the probability of S1 that we find the system in state S1, we would do um, modulus squared of S1 in our product with this whole mess, and we get just uh, one over two out of that. And similarly for S2, um, and here we've shown that we have a 50-50 probability of finding the states in the state S1 or S2 without assuming Born rule. So we've shown for the special case there, the quote okay. But here we have assumed, or so what about the operator in UPS? When we add that operator to the system, why are we sure that the probabilities don't change? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that was, that's a good question. So that was a, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's a good question. So, so yeah, it doesn't change the system, mm -hmm. right? But why do we assume that the probabilities won't change? So here we were, let's see. So, I mean, this is like a assumption we made at the very start that um, unitary transformations on the environment won't change the state of the system. And we're assuming the state of the system includes probabilistic outcomes on measurements on the system. Um, and then we showed that by act that we can undo this unitary specific unitary transformation on the system with a unitary transformation on the, just the environment. So I guess um, so if we have basically we said like. We have some state of the system, the state of the environment. We do a unitary transformation of just the system, and we get like S prime environment. And then we do something to just the environment. And we get that, get S prime E prime. And we showed that this thing here is equivalent to this. With a prime on the E, just to oh, be really, yeah. yes. We showed that these two things are actually the exact same state vector. And then we said, so, so then we said, we don't expect this unitary transformation on the environment to change the state of the system. So therefore we have some equivalence between this and this. That like the state here has to be the same as the state here. So then transitively, the state here has to be the same as the state here. I don't know if that 
No, okay. So I yeah. understand with the state, but how do we link the state with the probabilities? Mm. So the question, okay, so maybe the state is not going to change, but maybe the probability will change because we haven't implicitly or explicitly stated anything about the linking, how we link the probabilities to the state itself, right? I think that's this assumption here that um, the state determines everything you can know about the system, including measurement outcomes. So if the probability of measurement outcomes were different, then the state of the system would also be different. Okay. Um, so this is an additional thing that's added in. And you're right, without without this assumption, without, yeah, this this does sense. not, yeah, yeah, this doesn't okay. hold together. Okay. Yeah, no, it's good point and, and i should mention it this this does hold in standard quantum mechanics like the probabilities of measuring at, like well because we're starting from a principle of not knowing Born's rule but if you work through like under the assumptions of Born's rule you do unitaries on the environment indeed it does leave the probabilities on s the same so yeah. it's uh you know it, the assumption matches what many of us are comfortable with would it be good to show that uh Maybe that could be an, if you want. It could okay, be yeah. I mean, those if, interested. Yeah, if it's helpful, I'm yeah. happy to happy to show how you can show that. It's a one liner. Um, you know, I, I I mean, so something that's kind of hard for all these. Anytime you start with unitary quantum mechanics and you try to go like whether it's many worlds or something else, and you try to get probabilities, you always have to do some injection of probability at some point. And this is kind of our injection of probability as we say the state determines the probabilities. But if we never say like, if we just say, if we proceed without it, how to put it? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't say how we determine. Right. That we, they're kind of some. There's some uh, link. Yeah, link between them and that's it. You're right. And then and we're- the board of rule is like, you kind of, you, uh, you show how it shows how they are linked. Yeah, exactly. We're showing that the link has to be the Born's rule yeah. and not some up, like, you know, I could imagine, you could imagine, right, you could imagine, like, maybe it's just the, a world, a universe where it's just the modulus rather than the modulus squared or modulus cubed or whatever, and we normalize wave functions differently. Like, you know, you could, you could try working everything out like that instead, and we're showing that none of those things will actually work. Thank you. Get back. Figure out how to zoom this thing out. Uh, not equal. There we go. Okay, so now we're gonna treat try 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 tackling the case where we have a Schmidt decomposition with unequal coefficients. Um here, I'm just going to throw away phase factors because it gets too messy otherwise once we have all these numbers, but hopefully I've convinced you that that's an okay thing to do. So we'll start out with just rationals as the, co as the Schmidt coefficients. So we have some rational M and big and little m, and we this is a nicely normalized state like usual. And um, I kind of went out of order on this because I should show this and then come back and show that you can do a squeeze argument to get from rationals to real. Um, but for now, let's just deal with rationals. Um, and let's assume that our environment has some large number of dimensions, which is usually a good assumption in the world, um, at least M dimensions, big M dimensions then we can rewrite these special basis vectors like this. And let me give you a graphical argument to convince you that that's true. So let's say in, I have some state vector like this, and I wanted to rewrite it in terms of two other orthonormal vectors. I could just do this plus this with some normalization. Or if I want to do three vectors, and I need three dimensions, but we could put, have one of them, two of them going into the board and one coming out of the board. They'd all add up. 
So that's where this assumption of the environment has at least n dimensions is important. So we rewrite E0 in terms of um, some other set of vectors that we pick in this way. And we do it so everything's still nicely normalized. But the, the reason we, we pick specifically M vectors is if we now plug this back into our, so this, this is that decomposition of our environment basis vectors that I just mentioned. And this is our original wave function. Now, if we plug E0 in here, the one over M cancels with this little m out front. And the one over square root M minus M cancels with this. And we're left with something that's also a Schmidt decomposition because these are orthonormal bases that represent the same thing. Only now we have all the equal Schmidt coefficients. And we can apply our result from last time to say that these are all equally probable outcomes of, you know, we're equally probable to find ourselves in environment CK with, or C0 with measurement zero is C1 with measurement zero is one with, you know, one of these other environments. And then because again, we demand probability should add up to one, we can use this to, I just realize that's not showing up the same as on my screen. We can use this to recover Born's rule in exactly the same way as before. And that's Zurich's thing from invariance that I thought was cool and wanted to share with you all. Any questions about that? We still have a couple of minutes, so I can go on to some Gleason theorem stuff if people are interested, but. I would like to ask about this environment. Oh, totally, this yes. assumption, well, I mean, which, which, it doesn't seem like a terrible one, but like, so you're assuming you have lowercase m, uppercase yeah. m, extra states. In the environment, I don't know. Do you have to appeal to some belief that there are very, very many, you know, states in the universe? Like, it's sort yeah. of a pedantic point, maybe. But no, like I, I don't think it is. So I, so this I'm actually not sure of. Zurich argues that no, you don't, and I'll give you his argument. And if someone, I'm glad you're questioning me on this because I maybe it'll help clarify my own thinking on the issue. So he argues that no, you don't, because even if your immediate environment is low dimension, you wouldn't expect the physics to be any different if you embed it in a high dimensional environment. So he, I feel like this is a fairly qualitative argument though. Like I want the physics to be the same regardless of like, if I embed my environment in some large dimensional environment, I should recover the same physics. And on one level that feels right to me, but it's that mathematically very rigorous. So. I don't know if other people have a different thoughts on this, but. Well, yeah. What exactly is a low dimensional environment? Because, you know, we have a universe that inconveniently is filled with, you know, a lot of infinite dimensional things like fields. Yeah. Like space time itself. I mean, you could imagine maybe like a measurement apparatus being just one qubit acting on another qubit and then ask like, this argument doesn't hold exactly if we have a two-dimensional thing measuring a two-dimensional thing. If, you know, maybe it's the one of coefficients is like one over pi and the other one's whatever it takes to normalize one over pi. Um, so. Yeah, it's, I see your point. Yeah. I see your point. It's just very interesting that you have to invoke, but like you can't, can we not imagine a universe of, of two qubits? And do we really have to imagine that, you know? I mean, can you? What's the thing over here? That's a universe without any space or time. No, yeah, without space, yeah, I guess. Without space for sure. I suppose you could have time. But then time doesn't really happen. Maybe this is getting, that's getting a little deeper than I want. It's just that it seems, let me put it a different way, whether than my human brain can imagine the universe without, you know, the space that I've lived in my whole life. What I really mean is it seems strange that the formalism does not allow for you to consider some simplified finite dimensional setting. Is I guess my point. Yeah. Like in probability theory, you're perfectly welcome to just like, oh yeah, you have a point. That's just yeah. big. It's reminding me a lot of statistical mechanics applications for higher dimensional systems. Not high dimension, but like you have a lot of states. Or sorry, your system has to be big. Yeah. But 
Well, it still works for a small system. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Yeah, yes. like maybe you like isolate the two qubits and you let them interact or something, whatever isolation means. You can't, though. No, there's, there's at least one force that cannot be blocked. Uh, yeah. yeah. So here, here we're getting into the realities of the universe we exist in and the formalism we use to describe that universe. And it's just odd that it's just like, oh, you know, there's, there's an electromagnetic force that I feel in the universe, but it's like, why does that matter? Gravity? Can't operate at all. It can produce the brain. Sure. But so you can imagine, you know, infinitely perfect Faraday or whatever. Well, I can just I can just turn your reasoning on its head though. Such a case does exist. No, but you can approximate it arbitrarily. And that satisfies you? No, no, I'm saying so so you could do that, but you can't it, nothing you can do can prevent gravitational interactions. Okay. This is not my point. So I'm gonna I'm gonna see I'm gonna see my thesis. I yeah I'm yeah no I'm not sure. Zurich is definitely very sure and I'm not entirely convinced by Zurich. I'm bothered by the same thing you are that I like toy universes where you can think about them easily. So um I guess maybe this is true if you require that you can arbitrarily extend your rules for quantum mechanics to high dimensional universes and you want the same rules to apply, then I think this is true. But this very physically motivated argument, it becomes a lot less physical in such a low dimensional universe. So I don't know, that's my thinking about it. Yeah. Is um is lowercase m arbitrary? It's an arbitrary integer, sorry. Okay. Or real. Or, okay. Sorry. An arbitrary integer greater than or equal to so zero. This is for the rational with the denominator base. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Oh yeah, and I totally forgot to do the squeeze argument for this. I believe that that'll work. Though. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> I can see it. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So it gets better as m gets larger. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think we have. I don't know. We have. We have yeah. Uh, Let me jump back to the other slides then. Since we're sort of we're doing questions as we go clearly, so, so yeah. I feel like we can do a little bit. We have like ten minutes for, for at least. Yeah, sounds good. And keep just keep jumping in because I feel like every question that's been asked has been like something that I didn't specify very well or forgot to say. So I really appreciate them and keep keep them coming. Uh, which one is it? Here we go. So I get for trying to reorganize my slides in PowerPoint at the last minute. Oh, oh boy. Oh, okay. Down, 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 down. Okay, yeah, so um, I guess before I give Gleason's result, I just wanna briefly mention things that I think we can all probably agree on are, are good things to require of a probability measure. Um, one of those is we normally require probabilities of events to go from zero to one. And that here, so we, when we, first of all, Gleason, so there's kind of two ways of formulating measurements in quantum mechanics. There's what von Neumann did, which was the uh, projection value measurements. Um, and there's a more modern way called uh, positive operator value measurements that I'll talk about if time allows. Uh, Gleason's theorem specifically applies to projection value measurements which is what I think we're all probably most used to thinking about here. So, you know, we in this picture, we think of measurement outcomes as being some determined by some orthogonal set of basis vectors in our Hilbert spaces of things that could occur. And then we want to ask the question, like any probability measure that gives us the probability of some outcome, like the sum over those probability outcomes should, should be one. It's like a reasonable thing to ask. Um, and then finally, if uh, we, we, there's one way of stating the projection postulate is that if you measure a wave function, you get some outcome, and then you measure it again very quickly thereafter, you should get the same outcome of, of the measurements. Like measurements make sense, and we get the same thing if we do them suitably at suitably small time scales between them. So what that tells us is that if my wave function is in some state 
and I ask what the probability of finding it in that state is, if the probability should be one. Now, Gleason's theorem is a little bit gross in its original statement. Um, here he's defining this mu, which is that probability measure that I was, was talking about before. And he defines measures as things that kind of have these properties um, on sets of outcomes. And then he says, any such measure has to be represented by the trace of some density operator with, with a projection. And the proof of this is super, super gross. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really, I, 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 don't full, I don't really understand it. He's, he, the kind of outline of how he proves it is he proves, he defines these things called frame functions and three dimensions, which are kind of like probability on, on a unit sphere. And he shows that they have to be continuous and all those nice properties and regular. And then he show and that therefore they have to be represented by some end product. And then he does an inductive argument to extend it up to arbitrarily high dimensions. Um, the details of how he does that first step though, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer questions on. But um, more recently, oh, sorry. So if we take his result though, and we assume non-contextuality. So that is, um, what I mean by that is that the outcomes of measurements depend only on some state vector in a Hilbert space and the thing I'm measuring. And we also assume projection postulate, then we, then we can state this original theorem in this much simpler way that looks very familiar to us. Um, and kind of the assumptions we're making here are we're using here he doesn't make any reference to projection postulate but when we enforce that then we get that the uh mu of the identity operator has to be one and this lets you like kind of collapse the rest of the assumptions down into this much nicer statement of inner products that looks nice and familiar for how we usually state things um something that's kind of interesting here because we were talking about dimensions before is that this result only holds in three or greater dimensions and there's actually counter examples for probability measures you can make up in your mind for projection value measurements in two dimensions they're all discontinuous and super gross but they exist um <laughs> so again you could probably make the same argument i kind of hand waved before that if you want the same rule to apply to all dimensions then you should be able to extend this higher dimensional case down to two dimensions. But if that doesn't satisfy you, then it's not very satisfying for Gleason's original theorem if you want to talk about an individual qubit either. Now, Paul Bush is a person who wrote this book I really, really like about quantum mechanics. Um, but and he, he's a mathematician that does assorted like quantum measurement theory stuff in a very mathematical way. Um, and kind of as a side thing, he came up with a much, much simpler proof of Gleason's theorem in the old early 2000s that also holds for a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And the key difference, but, but his theorem isn't actually equivalent. Um, and to understand this non-equivalence, I have to talk a little bit about positive operator value measurements versus traditional projective measurements, which I thought I would just do on the board because I think it's most easy to see graphically and not do it rigorously in a rigorous math way, even though I'm sure Paul Bush would be disappointed in me for doing that. Um, so let's consider like some wave function that's in a one-dimensional world. When we do projection value measurements. The things we're allowed to add, or we're allowed to try projecting this wave function onto other vectors that live in the same Hilbert space. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe let's actually just do this in a discrete way. So I, I discretize my system along this axis. I say that the wave function has like some value here, some value here, some value here, some value here, and some value here. And then if I want to know the probability it's in this box, I just do the usual magnitude square to this. So that's projection value measure. But maybe my thing that does the measurement doesn't cleanly measure just one box. Like maybe what my measurement can do is it can tell me 
if the, if the particles in this box, I can tell me like 70% sure it's here and like, I don't know, 10% and 10%, whatever, 10% over here. So like that's like like response function of my measurement device I use to make my measurements. It's not a simple projection. And I can express the like all of these response functions still as kind of a projection, but um, as like a projection with some response associated with each basis vector. And that's how you formulate projection value measurements. So formally, the way this is written is I have some set of yeah, people often call these call these events rather than like measurements. So we have some set of events that can occur on over its phase. And then let's say that like F and G are are such events. Um well maybe I'll actually just call them F sub I. So we have some set F sub I of events. We can meaningfully talk, if we want to meaningfully talk about probable outcomes of an experiment, we demand the following. Just demand that the sum over all those events is the identity matrix. And this kind of makes sense, you know, if going back to my response function, I should normalize all my response functions. So all these like quasi projections so that I will definitely get some some outcome. And that's really all this is saying. Um, and then, oh, wait, I'm almost out of time. Sorry. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, one more minute or so. Maybe. Well, I guess I'll just conclude with like, rather than, so using, requiring that a Born rule-like thing applies to this larger set of measurement-like entities gives you a nice simple proof compared to Gleason's some original proof that's like a couple of paragraphs long. Um, and I have a link to the paper that people can look at if they want to see the proof for themselves. And thanks. Cool. Great. Yeah, and uh, can actually, could, could I steal these slides from you and maybe- Oh yeah, I'll send them read. to you. If they want to keep reading, um, yeah, I will, um, let's see, find a way to get that shared. Maybe in the next uh, uh, email or something. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much, Alex. Yeah. Uh, we have one more meeting, as I mentioned before. So please come out for that. And um, you know, you feel free to stick around as well, as long as we have this room. Uh, Dr. Alex would be happy to answer.